There's this dressing gown in the collection of the Powerhouse Museum that's dated circa 1835 and is made of thousands and thousands of little triangles sewn together. I wanted one for me, so I made one. This is not the only 19th century patchwork dressing gown out there, but it is my favorite. I think it's got a lovely shape and the dark velvet cuffs and collar really work well and make the overall effect a bit less busy. For my version, I also took some inspiration from this coat in the V&A collection. Most of the stuff I make is 18th century, or at least very heavily 18th century inspired, so this is a whole new era for me. I began this project a few years ago, before I started making videos, so I don't have any footage of the pattern drafting stage and we'll just have to show you the pieces. I tried to figure out the shapes of the pattern pieces on the original by looking at where it cuts through the patchwork. Because it's all half square triangles, there's a grid in it that makes the shapes a lot easier to see, just like with plaid garments. I drew it out as closely as I could on graph paper. I guess they didn't want to trim the edges off these triangles around the elbow, because the sleeves are a bit of a weird shape. I also referenced this 1830s coat pattern from the cut of men's clothes, which turned out to be very similar to my graph paper drawing. I drew up a pattern to my measurements based on both of these diagrams and did a mock-up, which fit pretty well, only needing a few little adjustments. The bodice has a very large piece for the front and side, and a narrow little piece for the back. The original dressing gown has a center front seam, but I left it off my pattern. All it would be doing is adding another bulky seam and cutting off part of the triangle pattern diagonally, when it could just as easily be continuous across the whole front. I can definitely see how the center front seams help with shaping on the coats that button up really high, but on mine the overlap is this much of the front. So yes, I know it should be there and is a standard feature of this style of 1830s pattern, but I left it out because I didn't want it. I'm going for decently historically accurate, not 100%. I made a copy of the front piece and cut it into the facing and front lining pieces. The only thing I really dislike about the original is how small and far apart the buttons are. They're so tiny you can barely see them in amongst all the triangles. First time I saw it I thought they'd fallen off. And it's only got one functional buttonhole in the front, right in the waist seam, which doesn't seem like enough of a closure for a garment that's meant to keep you warm. And there are other dressing gowns from this era that have a lot more functional buttonholes than that. So I'm making the buttons on mine bigger and with three functional buttonholes. I also rounded out the tips of the collar and the lapels a little bit. Nowhere near as round as the ones on the V&A coat, but I didn't want them to be pointy like they are on the original patchwork one. The velvet pieces are a nice soft contrast to the triangles, so I don't think they need any sharp corners. I emailed the museum with a few questions, and the curator very kindly sent me some photos of the inside. She also offered to let me come examine it in person, but I'm in Canada and the museum is in Australia, so unfortunately I had to decline. Two important facts that these photos reveal are that it's lined entirely in dark green silk taffeta, and that it's got a pair of tabs inside the button closed underneath the regular button closure. Button tabs, or belts that button closed, seem to be a fairly common feature on dressing gowns from this era. Most of the ones I've seen have them on the outside, but there may be more hiding inside some of them that nobody photographed, like there were on the triangle one. This one from the Met has them on both the inside and the outside. So I added that to my pattern, which was very easy because it's just a square. The collar is very wide at the front, though not quite as wide as the lapels, and scooped up a little bit narrower at the back. The under collar is quite visible on the original, but I'm guessing that's because it's deformed a bit in the past 190 years. Just like the bodice, the skirt also consists of a very large panel for the front and side, and a narrow one for the back. The center back skirt is a bit wider than the bodice piece to give it an overlap, same as the ones I'm used to on late 18th century coats. The side back seams have pockets with a very big opening, it's more than a third of the length. And then there are two piece sleeves, with the top of the outer sleeve being just a bit wider than the under sleeve to help with the little gathered shoulder puff. And a very simple false cuff. I sewed up this practice version in linen toile a while after I'd started the patchwork. Since I'd never done anything from this era before, I figured I'd make a lot of mistakes on my first go, which I did. And then on my patchwork version I made new and different mistakes, most of which I went back and corrected, and all of which I've included in this video. The original dressing gown is completely hand-sewn with what looks like English paper piecing, but I'm doing all my patchwork by machine. I do love hand-sewing and have made a lot of garments completely by hand, but whip-stitching 6,000 little triangles together was not very high on my priority list. Sorry. Also, I would like to mention that most of this patchwork footage has really bad lighting because it was filmed before I got this light, and before I covered up this ugly grey plastic table, but it looks a lot better by the time we get to the actual construction. Shortly after starting the patchwork, I measured my pattern pieces, and did my best to calculate the surface area and work out how many triangles I'd need. The number I got was 6,151, so I aimed for 6,160. The original is all silk as far as I can tell. A lot of it looks like waistcoat or dress fabric from the era, and there's also some damask that's probably reused from an 18th century garment. I ended up using mostly quilting cottons for mine. I'd wanted to use up more of my other scraps, but a lot of them are either very thick or very thin, and I figured they should be a somewhat similar weight. 
I think it's pretty common knowledge among historical costumers that fabric scraps used to be called cabbage, but did you know that the box the tailor stored the scraps in was called hell? So if you see an 18th century satirical drawing that involves tailors and also has fire and demons, that's why. I had hoped this project would make at least a small dent in my very large plastic bin full of quilting cotton, but it didn't. I don't know how I ended up with so much quilting cotton. I did not buy 95% of what's in here. I think it breeds. I cut my triangles in large batches. I'd press the fabric and stack it up next to my cutting mat, and cut them all out with a rotary cutter. First into long rectangles, then into squares, then into triangles. There were some end pieces that were uneven so I couldn't get a whole square out of them, and I just cut one triangle out of those whenever possible. I used my quilting ruler because it's much thicker than my beloved metric grid ruler, and therefore better at keeping the blade steady. Inches do have their uses, but I am a dedicated hater of any fraction smaller than half an inch, so I'm cutting these squares to 5.4 centimeters, no matter what nonsense that imperial quilting ruler may be trying to say. I sewed them with a 7mm seam allowance, which makes the finished triangles about 3 centimeters on the shorter sides. I started it off with my smaller pieces of quilting cotton, and a few scraps of various other medium weight fabrics, but later I also cut chunks off my larger pieces of quilting cotton to give it more variety. There are some pieces of silk taffeta in the mix, but not very many because they didn't behave well under the rotary cutter. A few of these prints look reasonably accurate for early 19th century, but a lot of them are modern, and that's fine. The whole point of patchwork is using up the little bits you've already got, and I didn't want to have any pieces of the same fabric touching edge to edge, so maximizing the number of different colors and prints was more important than keeping them historical looking. I wanted the color scheme to lean more towards greens and blues, because those are the colors I like best, and because they'll go nicely with the green accents and lining. I also used a decent amount of purple, and a lot of black, white, brown, and gray, and some red, but almost no yellow or orange. I tried to keep track of the number of different fabrics I used, and got a bit mixed up at one point, but it's approximately 222. That number might be a bit off, but there's no good way to go back and check. Some fabrics I cut dozens and dozens of pieces out of, and some were so tiny I only got two or three out of them. I'd cut out a few hundred triangles at a time, and after I'd finished I would count them by laying them out in stacks of ten. This is ten. This is one hundred. After I'd written down the number, I stored them in a very large biscuit tin. I didn't do all the cutting first and then all the sewing. I think I started the sewing after I'd cut out the first few thousand, and then after that I alternated between cutting and sewing. I didn't want to give myself a repetitive strain injury by doing any one thing for too long, and that rotary cutter really cramps up your hand after a while. My goal was 6,160, and because I was cutting in large batches and counting afterwards, I ended up with 6,332. At this point I thought I was done cutting out triangles. To sew them up, I paired different triangles right sides together and arranged them next to my sewing machine. I stuck a piece of tape to the throat plate so I could consistently make 7mm seam allowances. I used a very small stitch length, about 1 to 1.5mm, except for that one time I forgot and accidentally did a few pieces with a longer stitch length. This was a good way to use up some mostly empty spools, because the thread color didn't matter at all. With the long edges all neatly facing towards the machine, it was easy to run them through one after the other. It was the first time I've ever had my arms get tired just from putting pieces through a sewing machine. I then took these very long strings over to the ironing board where I could lay them out and clip the threads in between them more easily. I pressed all the seams open, and the resulting squares were also kept stacked up in the biscuit tin. Once I had accumulated a good amount of these, I'd lay them out on the ironing board and pair different ones together with the diagonal seams lined up. I'd sew these into rectangles and clip the threads and press them open just like before. and I'd sew those rectangles of 4 into squares of 8, and then again into rectangles of 16, and so on. 
that there are methods for sewing half square triangles together before cutting that make it go faster, but I wanted the colors to be distributed as randomly as possible. At first I was just pairing up individual triangles based on which colors I thought looked nice together, but then I realized I was putting the same fabrics together over and over again, and I would need to be more methodical in order to mix it up as much as I wanted. I spread all my triangles out on the table, putting each different fabric in its own pile. This isn't even close to all of them, I hadn't finished cutting at this point, so this is just one of multiple sorting and stacking sessions. I would then take a pile and place one triangle on top of each of the other piles until it ran out, and then I would carefully match up the top two triangles on each of those stacks. I started with the largest piles and left the smallest until last, and in this way I was able to ensure that I paired up each fabric with as many different ones as I could. After a while I stopped stacking them directly on the table next to the machine, and instead filled up the lid of my biscuit tin, and then this old glass microwave tray that I sometimes use as a paint palette. There were too many to sew up in one go, so putting them on trays meant that I could set them aside when I needed the table for something else. I've had some people assume that I had a bad time working on the patchwork, but I actually really enjoyed it. It was very calming to do such a repetitive task, and once I got into the triangle zone it was very difficult to stop. I loved putting all the different colors together and watching the pieces get bigger and bigger. I have some blocks on my timesheet that are more than 5 solid hours, and even after that much sewing I still didn't want to stop. It was harder to tear myself away from these triangles than from any other project I've ever worked on. The fact that I just could not put it down is actually the main reason it took so many years to finish. I would get it out, spend every possible moment working on it until a few days later when I was tired and sore and my sleep schedule was even more messed up than usual. Then I'd force myself to put it away and forget about it, and then months later I'd get it out and do that all over again. If I had been able to pace myself better, I honestly think I could have sewn all the patchwork without getting distracted by any other projects, which is not how I usually work at all. But then, I suppose if it had been easier to put down, I would have been more liable to get distracted by other projects. Anyways, I didn't use pins for the first few smaller seams, but once they got to the point where I was joining two rectangles of 16 together, I started pinning them. Thanks to the tape marking the seam allowance, most of the seams lined up more or less evenly, but with this many pieces, things are bound to shift by a millimeter or two. You can kind of stretch and ease them up to a certain point, but there were a few times when I had to unpick and re-sew a seam. At the points where eight different corners all come together, the seam allowances get very, very thick, and I sprayed these with water when pressing them. So, I've been told by someone who quilts that I should be trimming off all these little corners. I went back and trimmed all the easily reachable corners on all the pieces I had already sewn together, but didn't bother with the ones that were folded underneath the seam allowance and hard to get at. From then onward I trimmed the corners off at the most efficient step, which was after I'd sewn two small squares together but before I'd pressed them open. The first two garment pieces I finished were the narrow panels at the back of the skirt, which didn't get filmed, and then after that I started on the very large front skirt pieces. Once I'd put together a few really big squares, I laid the pattern piece out on my bed to help me see how many pieces of what size I needed to fill out the rest of the space, and this helped me make sure I wasn't matching up any two pieces of the same fabric edge to edge. I kept building up the pieces with more and more squares and rectangles until they were big enough to cut out. Tracing the pattern pieces onto the wrong side proved very annoying to do, and the lines were hard to see what with all those seam allowances so I just traced them onto the right side instead. These will be basted over later. I'd build up one piece, cut it out, and then reuse the leftover patchwork from around the edges on the next piece. Sometimes I had to partially unpick them to incorporate them back into the patchwork, but a lot of the angled scraps were easy to reuse on other edges. When I got to the sleeves, I discovered that I didn't have enough patchwork for them. I had underestimated the necessary number of triangles, and would need to cut more, even though I had already overshot my original estimate by 172, and even after unpicking every single usable triangle from the scraps. I laid the sleeve pattern over the large pieces of finished patchwork and did some counting, and found that I would need 624 more. Over the next day and a half, I cut what ended up being 625 more triangles, bringing my grand total to 6,957. I sewed those together and cut out my sleeves, and the patchwork was finally done. These are the scraps I had left from cutting out my patchwork pieces. Not much at all, since I kept reusing all the big ones. Because I had traced all my stitching lines onto the right side where they're nice and smooth, they weren't visible on the wrong side where I needed them to be. I did a running stitch around all the edges using some old yellow cotton thread, and marked the notches with perpendicular stitches. For the lining, I bought green and black shot silk taffeta that's very close to the color of the original lining, 
Theirs is not shot, but shot silk is perfectly historically accurate, and I think it's a bit prettier. The back skirt pattern piece is slightly too wide for my table, so I had to cut those on the floor. I swept thoroughly beforehand and still ended up with a bit of dust on my fabric. Cutting things out on the floor is horrible and I hate it, but it's not worth going all the way to my parents' house for so few pieces. The pocket bags are very tightly woven off-white cotton, with a green silk facing around the opening. I decided it would be best to interline all the pieces with flannel, to add extra warmth and to help smooth out the patchwork a bit. The middles of all the triangles are only one layer of fabric, and then there are those incredibly dense bumpy areas where eight corners all intersect. I used up a bunch of odd little remnants of flannel from my stash. I cut them a few millimeters smaller than the pattern pieces so the edges wouldn't get in the way of the seams. I used thinner flannel for the sleeves, a medium weight for the skirt, and a slightly thicker and stiffer one for the body, excluding the lapels. That one is from an old OB interlining, so it's very narrow, and I had to piece the sides. I had to piece the corners of the back skirts, too. I also cut out a layer of flannel for the collar because my silk lining is very thin, and it looks like there's a layer of something a bit squishy in there on the original collar. The facings, collar, and cuffs are all a silk and rayon velvet, which in this case means the ground fabric is silk and all the fuzzy pile is rayon. It's a pretty similar color to the lining, but slightly more blue. The velvet on the original looks black in the website pictures, but distinctly green in the ones that were sent to me, so I think my velvet is the perfect color. I've had this in my stash for about seven or eight years, and had actually dyed it to this color back in college, not knowing what I'd eventually do with it. We were doing a bunch of dye samples, and I loved one of the velvet ones so much that I wanted a bigger piece of it. It was Pro MX Fiber Reactive Dye in the color Marine at 4%, in case anyone wants to know. I had slightly less than half a meter, which turned out to be just enough to squeeze all the velvet bits out without having to do any piecing. I do love piecing, but would rather not do any extra seams with velvet. The stuff is very wobbly and annoying to trace. Now for the interfacing. I have to admit, I don't really know what I'm doing when it comes to 19th century tailoring. I'm used to 18th century tailoring, which is very different and a lot simpler. You, you just stick some buckram in there and never have to do any pad stitching. I did do some modern tailoring in college, but that was back in 2015 and I'm sure I've forgotten a lot of it. And modern tailoring is also very different from 1830s tailoring. It's pretty difficult to find information on early 19th century tailoring, and most of what I have found is about coats, which seem to be more complicated than dressing gowns. Most of my reference books are just 18th century, and the one with the 1830s coat pattern doesn't have any information on the construction or interfacing. And I don't want to invest in any new reference books just to use them for one project. I'm also working with a very different material from all these coats, and the techniques that work on wool aren't necessarily going to work well on cotton patchwork. So I'm just going to do my best to make it look nice without worrying too much about how accurate the construction is. I cut out two pieces of stiff linen collar canvas for the collar, and for the fronts. Collar canvas is stiffer than what you'd normally need for lapels, but because my outer material is so bulky and bumpy I really needed that extra stiffness. I cut the second front piece without flipping the pattern over to save on material, and then just flipped it over after cutting it to mark the fold line on the correct side. I should have left extra material along the front edge to account for the rolling, but I forgot to. The lapel is wide enough that it still turned out okay though. For the little button tab I cut a piece of buckram, plus an extra layer for the buttonholes and buttons. This is a strip from one of my old worn out linen shirts, which I've stiffened with glue. Now I needed a bit of padding to fill out the collarbone area. My shoulders are uneven, so I cut two layers of cotton batting for the left side and three for the right. I was ironing out this scrap of batting before cutting, and now there's gunk on my iron? I think there was fusible stuff on one side of the batting. I don't know where this scrap came from, and I did not expect there to be fusible stuff on it. Apparently fusible batting exists, and it made me have to clean my iron. Interesting. With all my pieces cut out, it was time to attach the interlining. I used a grey silk thread and lightly waxed it. I took a couple of stitches through each of the eight corner intersections, where the seam allowances are the thickest and I could attach it securely without worrying about the thread showing on the outside. I would not do anything like this if I were interlining something made of normal fabric, but I don't know how all well the seam allowances will stay pressed open over time and with wear, especially on the longer seams between the larger chunks of patchwork. I don't want them flipping around and I don't want the flannel sagging, so hopefully stitching these two layers together will prevent that. Um, I don't know where else to put this. But I've gotten a lot of comments on the social medias calling this quilted, but it's not quilted, it's just patchwork. This seems to be a pretty common misunderstanding, but quilting and patchwork are not the same thing. Patchwork is when something is made of a lot of little pieces sewn together, and quilting is typically made with two layers of fabric with batting sandwiched in between, and then you stitch through all three layers to hold them together, and that stitching is visible on the outside. So patchwork quilts are very common, but you can have quilted things that are not patchwork, and patchwork things that are not quilted. They're not interchangeable words. At first I tried carefully sewing down the edges of the flannel pieces as well, but then realized I could finish those off later. 
For the areas that had to be pieced, I started connecting them with a herringbone stitch, but it wasn't sitting very smoothly. I tried a big whip stitch instead, and that worked better. Now my pieces were almost ready, but I still had some unnecessarily thick areas in my garment seam allowance, from all those layers of the patchwork seam allowance. I clipped all these off at an angle to make things a bit less bulky. After adding the interlining, I couldn't fold the pieces up very much, so from then on I kept them in a big stack which I moved between the ironing board, my table, and my bed. I considered doing some of the outer construction seams to my machine, but was worried there would be problems with the tension because of how varied the thickness is, so I decided to hand sew them with heavy black linen. I did a back stitch in the thinner areas and a stab stitch in the thicker ones, keeping just inside the basted outlines. This went very slowly, but it worked. My tension was nice and my seams pressed open smoothly, again with the help of some water for the really bulky areas. I wanted to make sure the seam allowances stayed flat, and I also wanted to finish off the flannel edges, so I held them down with a herringbone stitch. I used the same grey silk thread, but doubled it this time. Like tacking down the flannel, this is not something I would do under normal circumstances, but the patchwork is a tricky material and I don't want it misbehaving. I finished off the first sleeve seam before starting the second, so I could do it flat on my table, and for the second one I used my sleeve board. The curve of the elbow didn't fit over it very well, so I just held it over my hand for that section. I started finishing the ends of the sleeves in the same way, but then I remembered that that part would all be covered up with velvet, so I just tacked it with a big running back stitch. I sewed up the sleeve linings by machine, and while I was at it I sewed the center back and skirt lining seams as well. I lined up the edges of the sleeve head and sewed on the linings with a running stitch, going right along my basted outline. I found that my sleeves could stand up on their own, which was pretty neat. Then I remembered that sewing the lining on around the top edge was the wrong thing to do, and took the running stitches out, after basting the lining in a few centimeters below. On my 18th century things I'm used to pressing the sleeve and armhole seam allowances in towards the shoulder, but that seems to have changed by the early 19th century, so I need to leave room to press my seam allowances out into the sleeve head. <laughs> 
The other dressing gowns and coats from this era appear to have the seam allowances pressed outward, because the sleeve on those ones has a bit of a bulky ridge along the edge that's higher than the shoulder fabric. On the 19th century ones, the sleeve attachment looks like like this, and then on the 18th century ones, it's like this because they want a slimmer shoulder. Because the material is so very, very thick, the sleeve lining was too big and wasn't going to sit smoothly around the inside of the cuff, so I had to take it out again and take one of the seams in a little bit. I didn't worry about the top part of the sleeve since it doesn't show and will be gathered into the armhole anyways. I sewed up the cuffs with green silk thread. Pressing velvet is a bit tricky since I don't have a needleboard, but a towel makes a decent enough substitute if you press very lightly and carefully with no steam. I actually pressed all my velvet seams at the same time, but if I presented all the little steps in the exact order I sewed them, then this video would be all over the place. The lower edge of the cuff gets tacked onto the inside of the sleeve with a running stitch, and then I basted it to the sleeve, carefully smoothing it upwards before attaching the top edge with a small slip stitch. Sewing the lining down along an edge is usually easy, but this was surprisingly frustrating. The velvet made the lining creep way too close to the outside edge, and I was so unhappy with it that the day after finishing both cuff linings I redid them. This time I turned the cuff inside out and basted the lining down, and then sewed it back on. It was only a little bit further in, but definitely an improvement. Brief interruption just to say that I have a Patreon. There's no sewing there, just dinosaur comics, but the dinosaurs help pay for the sewing. I also have a bunch of stuff on Spoonflower and Redbubble. Do you want a travel mug version of that 1760s fossil teapot from the Met? Now onto the bodice. I was a bit intimidated because, as I mentioned, I hadn't done any 19th century tailoring, aside from the practice dressing gown I made over three years ago, and hadn't done any modern tailoring since 2015. I basted the canvas on, leaving the lapel free, and sewed the cut-off edge down to the flannel layer. I'd started off trying to do the historically accurate form of pad stitching, where you take the stitches along the length of the roll instead of across it. Nicole Rudolph talks about it in the 1840s Gonzo Coat video, and you can see from the horizontal lines under the collar that that's the way it was done on the original dressing gown. But I found it extremely difficult and ineffective, especially with how uneven my material is, and very quickly switched to modern pad stitching instead. Normally I really love historical sewing methods, but I can't think of any possible advantages of making the stitches go that way. Pad stitching is already awkward enough, trying to keep the wide end of the lapel all folded up in your hand. I also had to tear up my first few rows and start over, because I realized I'd gone and drawn the roll line from the point where the collar meets the lapel, when it should have been slightly further in. It was a pretty foolish mistake not to trim back the edge of the very thick flannel when I redid the roll line. This made the lower end of the roll a decent size, but the top part much thicker. I'd stayed up very late working on this, and I guess my sleep-deprived brain was not thinking clearly. I had also started noticing that the lapels were just a tad lumpy and could maybe use some interlining too, so I decided to pick out all my pad stitching and start over again. Which wasn't a big deal. No matter how much I have to redo, it'll still be less time than I spent on the patchwork. And because I spent so much time on that patchwork, I want to make sure I do a good job on the construction. Thankfully, this grey silk thread is not the best quality, and I have a lot of it, so I'm not worried about having wasted a few meters. After removing the stitches from the canvas, I pulled out all that herringbone stitching along not the roll line, and cut the excess off along the actual roll line, plus an extra 7 or 8 millimeters. I cut interlinings for the lapels from the very thin purple flannel I used for two of the sleeve pieces, and sewed it down to the edge of the heavier flannel, with the edges overlapping just a little bit. I'm not sewing it down anywhere else because it will need to roll with the layers. I pressed the canvas pieces, redrew the roll lines, and basted them back onto the fronts. I decided I wanted to tape the roll line this time around, 
This is to prevent the edge from stretching out of shape, since it's on the bias. I don't know if they did that yet in this era, but I'm doing it anyways, because I wasn't satisfied with how this part was sitting before. Like a lot of things, it would be different if it was a nice wool, but this patchwork material is so chunky that it needs more help with shaping. My local fabric store didn't have any proper tailor's tape, so I used this rather loosely woven twill tape, which is not ideal, but it'll do. I'm whip stitching it down along both edges, just on the inside of the line I drew. My patch stitching turned out much better the second time around, though I did have to restart the second lapel after a few rows because it wasn't curving as tightly as the first one. It was awkward to hold all the extra material in my hand in a way that wouldn't disturb the rolling, but I got a bit better with the practice that came from me doing it so many times. I'm glad I used collar canvas for the lapels instead of something lighter, because the bumps still show through a little. It's a bit embarrassing that I had to redo them so many times, but I hadn't done any pad stitching in three years, and hadn't done very much of it before that. I've made other things with lapels since then, but 18th century ones don't have pad stitching. You just don't put any interfacing in the lapels and they flop over. So much easier. At some point in all of this, I sewed the velvet facing to the front lining. Since the velvet is so shifty and difficult, the facing had to be basted on before sewing. After that, it was fairly easy to whip stitch to the lining. I sewed tape on from the bottom of the front edge all the way up to the roll line, and it ended up a bit too far in to fully cover up the canvas edge in a few places. On the lapel I was able to sew through all the layers because those stitches will be on the underside with the pad stitching and they won't show, but for the little bit of the front edge that's facing outwards I made sure to only catch it on the patchwork seam allowances. I trimmed off all the excess purple flannel, then folded the edges in and whipped them down to the tape, except for the very thick bits where I had to stab stitch it. There were a couple of places where the eight corner intersections were right on the edge of the lapel, and I had to cut a little chunk out of the canvas and tape to get it to fold over smoothly. I stopped a couple centimeters before the bottom so as not to get in the way of sewing the waist seam. Now I had another problem. The combined thickness of the tape and seam allowance made the lapel so uneven that I knew if I just sewed down the velvet now I'd end up with a very noticeable ridge around the edge. So I cut out another couple pieces of flannel, a bit bigger than my lapels, and pinked the outside edges to make the line less noticeable. I cut off the corner and folded the edges in about two centimeters and joined them up smoothly to the seam allowance and tape. On the roll line I just cut it straight across and roughly stitched it down to the tape. Now seemed like a good time to attach the back pieces to the fronts, and thank goodness those are the only two opposing curved seams on this thing, because they were not easy to sew. Because the patchwork is so stiff in some places and so flexible in others, it made it very tricky to line up smoothly. I had to baste them with heavy-duty thread before sewing them because when I tried without basting, my seam went very wonky. I also had to trim back the edge of the flannel a bit more, even though I had already cut it smaller than the pattern pieces. I'm backstitching and stab-stitching with black linen and then tacking down the seam allowances. <laughs> 
On the left seam, completely by accident, I ended up with an almost perfectly matched triangle of the same blue fabric. I then basted the center back and shoulder seams, so I could try it on and make sure I was putting the collarbone padding in the right place, and mark the button overlap. It was a bit narrower than when I first drafted it four years ago, because I've gotten a bit wider, which makes me even more glad that I left out the center front seam. It probably would have been a good idea to add the padding to the canvas before attaching it to the front, but with all the layers of the main fabric it was easy to stitch on without anything showing on the outside. Now it was finally time to add the wonderful velvet facings. As one more precaution to keep things from looking uneven, I ironed a tiny bit around the edges to crush the pile so it's a bit less bulky. I basted them in, starting with the lapels. Whip stitching the velvet on went very slowly, and I seemed to have pushed the edge upwards and stretched it out a bit on my first one, so I ended up trimming down the top edge a bit and readjusting it. This stuff is so wiggly and drapey and I really didn't want it to sag, but I overcompensated and stretched it a bit too tightly. It was alright after taking out some more of the basting. Now that I've got the front lining finished on the left side only, it's time to do the buttons, so I can sew them on through all the layers except the lining. I already have an entire video on making covered buttons, so I won't go into too much detail here. These ones are made with wooden spacer beads and covered in my silk lining fabric. The buttons on the outside are 2.5cm and the ones on the tabs are 2cm. I'm starting with the interior tabs, so I can do a couple warm up buttonholes through thinner material before I tackle the ones on the outside. I folded over the end of the piece that I cut longer for the buttonholes, and sewed it down by machine, along with the button stand on the other side. Then I just covered and finished them the same way I do the edges of 18th century garments. I basted the velvet in place, tacked it down along the edges, and then whip stitched the lining in a couple millimeters from the edge. Doing a running stitch around your buttonholes before cutting them open is good practice in general, but extra important with shifty fabrics like this. I cut them with my very small buttonhole cutter because I still haven't got any bigger chisels, and clipped a bit more material out for the rounded end of the keyhole. I overcast the edges with fine silk thread. I usually use cotton pearl for buttonholes because it's less expensive, and this was my first time using silk buttonhole twist. I like to wax the tip of the buttonhole thread to help it stay in the fabric without tying any knots. The buttonhole twist was nice and slippery, but surprisingly prone to separating and getting snagged on things. Once I got back around to the flat end of the buttonhole, I did a bar tack. I'm used to doing these at both ends on 18th century buttons, since the keyhole shaped ones didn't start showing up until the early 19th century. Adding the lining after the buttons on the second tab made it harder to sew the lining on, but if I'm hiding the button threads on the bodice I may as well hide them here too. <laughs> 
The only external buttonhole on the original is in the waist seam, so I'll have to do that one later, but the two extra ones I'm adding will go in now. And I do have to point out that the original appears to have been lined after the waist seam was sewn, because that waist seam buttonhole is higher than the bottom of the facing, but I really don't want to do things in that order. I'm putting mine together in a way that keeps it in relatively small chunks for as long as possible, so I don't have to maneuver around gigantic bulky pieces of material any more than is necessary. So, getting back to the buttonholes, they lined up perfectly with two of the horizontal seams on the front, which was not intentional, but very nice. Unfortunately, they also ended up right on top of the very thick eight corner intersections. I decided to use my grommet hole punch for the rounded ends, because there was no way I was going to clip neatly through all those layers with scissors. I also brought the entire needle down through the hole to the underside before making each buttonhole stitch, which was much slower, but that way I could easily catch all the layers. I took the stitches at a bit of an angle so I could get more of the velvet under the threads on the inside, but still have a very thin buttonhole on the outside. I was going to say, thank goodness there are only five buttonholes, but at this point, what difference does it make? I would have sewn 20 or 30 without complaining. I once made a coat with 79 hand-sewn buttonholes, and I will do it again. I should mention that the original has what appears to be another buttonhole over on the other side of the waist seam, and I can't see a button for it on the inside, but a lot of double-breasted things with a wide overlap do have an extra fastening somewhere to prevent sagging, so I think that's what this is. Modern coats and jackets often have a hidden button on the top of the overlap, and late 18th century waistcoats have one functional buttonhole at the bottom of the row of decorative buttons. But my dressing gown overlap is not particularly wide, and the fronts are so heavily stiffened that it doesn't sag at all. The keyhole shape made it easy to mark the button locations right through the holes, which is something I usually do after the overcasting step on 18th century ones. I added a button stand to the area where the three functional buttons go, which is just a scrap of buckram folded in half. The functional ones need to get sewn on with a thread shank, but the decorative ones just get sewn flat to the garment. I had to unbaste the lining on the left side because I had done it too soon without thinking. After all the buttons were attached, I sewed on the second lapel facing, this time sewing the edge on before basting the rest of the lining in place. As you can see, there was a bit of a problem with the lining. The back portion on both sides is angled up further than it should be and extends well past the side back seam presumably because I had sewn the facing to the lining with a smaller seam allowance than the one I'd marked out. Fortunately, as most 19th century tailors would probably tell you, the solution is simply to add a little dart. Now onto the skirts. I whip stitched the silk facings onto the pocket pieces and sewed down the other three sides by machine. I also machine sewed the pocket bag pieces to the skirts, but went back to hand stitching for the very long skirt seams. <laughs> 
to machine sew the pocket halves together, but didn't feel like getting my machine out again just for two seams. I did the herringbone stitch on the seam allowances here too, except for the ones on and underneath the pocket. The top of the pocket will get caught in the waist seam later, but for now I've quickly tacked it down so it doesn't move around. The front and back edges, being cut on the bias, will definitely stretch and sag if I don't reinforce them. I still haven't ordered any tailor's tape, but I have some wide twill tape in my stash and I added that to the four straight edges. I tacked the seam allowances down, including all around the hem, again leaving a little bit free for the waist seam. Skirt pieces don't quite fit on my table, so I smoothed out and pinned the lining on in sections. I based it all around the edges, leaving enough room to fold in the seam allowances and sew them down. I used a different silk thread for that, lighter weight than the buttonhole twist, but a lot thicker than the stuff on the spools. Now it's just the collar left to do. After overlapping the two halves of the collar canvas and doing a herringbone stitch on each side, I realized that cutting the flannel with no seam allowance was a terrible idea for a piece that needed pad stitching, so I recut it a bit bigger. The flannel gets sandwiched in between the silk taffeta and the collar canvas. I basted it along the row line so the layers wouldn't shift while I did the first row. I'm doing moderate pad stitching again because the more historically accurate option is very frustrating and impractical and I don't want to do it even though I can see it's the kind they did on the original. On some of my 18th century things I try to sew them as accurately as I can, but this is not my era so I don't care quite as much. And I am making this for my everyday wardrobe. I'm not a reenactor, I can do whatever I want. I held the collar against the lapel before starting, just to check and make sure I was doing the roll in the right place. Like the lapels, the collar was a bit awkward to hold because it was so wide, but got easier once I got closer to the edges. I wish I'd cut the silk with more seam allowance too, because it ended up being very narrow on one of the edges, which made it a bit difficult when tacking those seam allowances down. Leaving the flannel mostly untrimmed gave that edge a bit more stability. Just like the cuffs, I backstitched the velvet collar pieces together with doubled silk thread. The seam came out a bit wobbly, but not enough to cause any problems. It's getting close. Everything is in big chunks ready to be put together. We need to be strategic and keep things relatively flat and easy to work on for as long as possible. 
So I'm going to do the waist seam next, and then once that's all finished up, I'll add the tabs in the front, and then the center back seam, and then I can do the shoulder seams and add the sleeves and collar and the back lining. I had to leave a gap for the buttonhole in the waist seam, so I measured and marked it out before starting. It didn't seem right to have buckram on only one side of it, so I cut an extra little piece to add underneath, before tacking down the seam allowances as usual. And after sewing the waist seam on the other side, I tacked down the remaining portion of the button stand. Now I could finally sew the last buttonhole. It came out more wonky than the other ones, but not too bad. Then I buttoned it up and marked the last functional button, and sewed it on, along with the remaining three decorative ones. Then I closed up the rest of the lining waist seam. To mark the location of the tabs, I fastened all the buttons and propped up the sides of the bodice to account for the curve around the body, then pinned the tabs on. One of the tabs on the original is coming undone, so you can see that it's been sewn to the inside facing backwards, then flipped forward to cover the raw edges and sewn down again. After marking the attachment point, I had to transfer the markings to the other side of the tabs, and then flipped them over and sewed them in using a backstitch for both seams. It was a bit tricky to hold, but I was able to stitch it to the buckram layer without any marks showing on the outside. Now I had to sew the center back seam, so from here on everything was twice as heavy and even more annoying to move around. In 18th century things I'm used to the upper back lining being the very last thing to go in, but the collar and sleeves on this dressing gown are different, and after thinking it through I decided the back lining should go in now, 
I basted it in and whip stitched the sides and bottom. Now it was time to deal with the center back vent. These ends were already lined and finished, and I just had to overlap them and sew them down to the waist seam, which was quite awkward. For the outer one I used the heavier green silk thread, and tried to not let the stitches show too much on the outside, but they still did a little bit. I sewed up the shoulders, and sewed the lining down to the neck and arm openings. I set the sleeves in next, because having the collar in the way would make that area a lot more stiff and awkward. I did my two rows of gathering stitches with heavy duty thread, and basted the sleeves in first to check the fit. I had to redistribute the gathers a bit, but after the second try they were good. I did worry that they might be a bit too long, and I drafted the pattern so long ago that I couldn't remember if they were supposed to be this length, but I looked at some 1830s portraits and saw lots of long coat sleeves, so I figure I must have patterned it that way on purpose. Not to sound like a broken record, but I'm used to 18th century sleeves, and most of them are considerably shorter. Setting in fitted sleeves is usually at least a little bit annoying, and in this material it was extra annoying. On my first sleeve, I had to go back and sew over the gathering a second time, because everything was so thick I'd left some gaps. I clipped the lining seam allowance, and just pulled apart the ends of some seams for the patchwork seam allowances. I'm not going to try tacking these edges down to the interlining, I'm just shoving them all out into the sleeve head and they can do what they want in there. On the gathered section, I did a few little pleats in the lining. I find it easier to do it this way than to try and gather the lining to match, and you see gathers on the outside and pleats on the lining in a lot of 18th century breeches. I use the heavier silk thread to sew the lining down, since this is an area that has to take a lot of strain. And the very last thing to attach is the collar. After pinning it on, I basted it in place with heavy duty thread, and tried it on one last time to make sure it was sitting correctly. I sewed it on with more of that heavy silk thread, using whip stitches for most of it, but carefully stab stitched the ends, which were very curved and awkward. To make sure the velvet was nicely smoothed out on top, I first pinned it, then basted it a little ways in from the edge, then folded the edges in and basted it again. back to the thinner green thread to sew this edge down, and I'm using a very small slip stitch. A whip stitch would be faster, but I tried that on my first lapel and it disturbed the pile a bit and made for a slightly rougher looking edge. And it was finished!
don't have any good places to take photos in the apartment, and when I took some shots at my parents' house, the lighting turned out very bad, so I'm sorry about that. Hopefully I'll be able to get some good pictures of it this coming winter. Okay, time for final thoughts and numbers and things. I'm very happy with how this turned out and so glad to have it finished and off the pile. I finished it on May 11th right as the last little bit of snow was melting and the tree started budding, so it's a bit warm for it now, but I'm looking forward to wearing it this coming winter. Numbers. Eh. As mentioned previously, I cut 6,957 triangles, but, eh. but there were some from around the edges that got lost in the cutting out process, especially in the very last sleeve piece. I don't know how many that was, but probably just a few dozen. But if I add up the lining, interlining, interfacing, and velvet, not counting the button covers or the pieced on corners, it comes to 61 more pieces, which combined with the triangles makes 7,018. I'm going to put over 6,000 pieces in the thumbnail because I talked about that number a lot earlier and because it's still under 7,000 if you exclude all the ones that got lost in the cutting out, but 7,018 pieces were cut out and sewn together for this. The number of different fabrics in the patchwork is approximately 222, but as I mentioned, I kind of lost count, so that might be slightly off. And the time! I tracked it all separately, so I've got my triangle cutting out on one time sheet, my triangle sewing on another, and a third one for the rest of it. That's the cutting out, the lining, and all the other bits, and the construction. Also, every time I filmed while sewing, I'd subtract a minute or two from the time I wrote down, just to account for the time I spent adjusting the camera and tripod, because I want this to be just the sewing time. The triangle cutting took 53 hours and 43 minutes. The triangle sewing took 181 hours and 41 minutes. So the patchwork altogether took 235 hours and 24 minutes. And the construction was 135 hours and 40 minutes, which is so much more than it would normally take because of all the hand tacking and how difficult it was to sew the seams and the really chunky bits of the patchwork. And because I made a lot of mistakes and had to redo stuff. If I'd sewn this up in an easy to work with fabric and done everything right the first time, it would have taken half as long or less. The linen practice version was only 54 hours. So that means the entire dressing gown took 371 hours and four minutes. A huge thank you to my friend Ollie for making this timesheet that does the math for you. Uh, that saved me so much time and headache. I'll leave a link to it for anyone who wants to make a copy and also use it. I didn't keep track of the monetary costs, but it wasn't too bad. The most expensive part was the silk lining. It's gone up in price since I bought it, but it was 20 something dollars a yard at the time, and I think I bought three yards. I bought three different kinds of silk thread and some collar canvas, but the buckram was from my stash. I used 14 button molds, but those were super cheap wooden spacer beads. All the flannel was either from the thrift store or was left over from other stuff. And all the outer fabric was either given to me or was left over scraps, or both. And I think my mother gave me the velvet. So I'm pretty sure the total cost was less than a hundred Canadian dollars. And it weighs just a little over four pounds. I feel like leaving it on a hanger all the time will put a lot of strain on the shoulders, but I don't have any other way to store it. And if I fold it up and put it in a box, the velvet will get kind of messed up. Observations from wearing it. Ugh, dang, it's so stiff I can't comfortably rest my elbow on the table. It also makes it difficult to get an oven mitt on all the way. It's fitted and the front is very stiff, but it's not tight, so it's comfortable but not in a slouchy way. Definitely a good posture kind of garment, so if I want to be more of a potato I'll have to wear a loose wrapping gown instead. It's also nowhere near as warm as I expected. I thought with all that material and all the air pockets in between the layers, surely it would be extremely toasty as soon as I put it on, but it actually feels very breathable. I'll be interested to see how well it does in colder weather. Update. It's unusually cold today and our heat appears to be broken, so it's about 16 degrees in here right now. The dressing gown honestly isn't doing much. I've got a flannel undershirt on underneath my nightgown and flannel pajama bottoms, and I'm still kind of cold. The dressing gown is adding a layer of warmth, but not a very significant one. It's, it's a little bit warmer than the linen version, but I expected it to be a lot warmer, so I'm puzzled.
If I ever do another one of these, I'll add two layers of flannel. The pockets are a good size, but I don't expect I'll use them much, if at all. I never use the pockets in my linen one. If I'm mostly just in one room, I don't need to carry things around in pockets, and they're a little bit awkward to reach. The interior button tab doesn't really seem to add much. I don't think it looks very good when it's fastened, but the outer buttons aren't, because the fronts are so stiff they just stick out straight. I think maybe the one on the original is to help compensate for the fact that there's only one button on the outside, and since I added two more buttonholes to mine, I don't really need that. But that other one from the Met also has one, and it's got four functional buttonholes on the outside. But it looks a lot less stiff, and the lapels sort of flop open in a much nicer way. Hmm. I'm guessing the original patchwork dressing gown is also less stiff than mine, because it, it looks like mostly thin silks, and I think I probably added much heavier interfacing than theirs has. I don't know. I could remove the tabs, but they're not getting in the way, so I'll just leave them. I think the waist seam could stand to be just a little bit higher, because there are some wrinkles on the side. I'm not sure if that's because my body's changed since I drafted the pattern, or because the material is so much more bulky than the linen version, or a combination of both. The collar looks surprisingly uneven from the back, and I don't know how that happened. It's about a centimeter lower on the right side. The shoulder seams themselves measure the same length, so it must be the collar structure that's to blame. I thought I had done my pad stitching symmetrically, but evidently something went a little bit wrong. It's okay though, it's not noticeable from the front. It does make it a bit funny that I padded out one side to account for my uneven shoulders, and then ended up with unevenness on the shoulders anyway. I think the buttonhole at the waist seam is not too bad, but it's kind of wonky and I do think I could have done a bit better. My buckram wasn't quite pushed all the way into those folded edges, so the buttonhole itself isn't stiffened along the edge like the other two, and I think if I tacked down the seam allowances of the buckram in that area first and then whip stitched those edges together, they would have been tighter. And I definitely should have basted it closed before punching the hole in the end. It was really dumb of me not to do that. And I had to go back and try to punch it a little bit more and ended up with a keyhole that's slightly too wide. But I'm being very nitpicky here. It's fine, and I think the other two buttonholes turned out really well considering the unevenness of the fabric. I kind of wish that the buttonhole twist was a darker, more saturated green, but I also kind of like how it blends in from a distance and doesn't stand out as much as the buttons. I wish I'd used green thread for the collar pad stitching instead of grey, even though it's completely hidden. Um, I also wish I'd used a cotton with a smoother finish for the pocket bags, because the one I did use is very stiff and sturdy, but it's got kind of a soft, fuzzy finish, which is not ideal for pockets. But again, I probably won't use them, so whatever. I think I should have ordered some actual tailor's tape at the same time I ordered the collar canvas. I thought my local fabric store had some, but it didn't. I don't think anything catastrophic will come of me having used twill tape, though. There are also a few fabrics I regret using in the patchwork. This one and this one are too thick, this one's too thin, and a few of them have a somewhat stiff and unpleasant texture and didn't press as nicely. But these are all pretty small complaints. I think it turned out really good, because I ripped out and redid all my big mistakes. I'm very happy with how smooth I got that velvet to lie, and I'm really pleased with how nicely lined up my triangles are. There are some that are a bit off, but most of them look very neat and tidy. And some of the fabrics are given to me by friends, which is nice. These ones are from Dross, this one is from Nikessa, and I've also got some from my late grandmother's fabric stash. This print and the solids that go with it are left over from a quilt that my uncle has now. I love that it's overall a much cooler color scheme than the original, which has very warm colors. And I'm very glad I made the buttons bigger. I also really like the way the buttons are arranged on double-breasted 1830s coats, narrow at the bottom and sort of curving out slightly as it goes up. It looks very nice. It reminds me of... You know when people have extra nipples, they always grow them along what's called the mammary ridge or the milk line? It looks like the diagrams of that. It's like your body's agreeing that it's a good button placement. This was my first patchwork project, and I learned that I really enjoy patchwork. I definitely want to make more patchwork garments. Something with irregular pieces would be fun. I've done a few small pieces of quilting, but I've never made a quilt, and I think that would also be really fun. And much easier, because it's just a big rectangle. This was my second 19th century tailoring project, excluding a few horrible waistcoats I made about 10 years ago. And my first one was the linen practice version of this, so I don't have any other 1830s things to go with it. Nor do I have plans to make any. And that's fine, because it's just for at-home wear, and I'll mostly be wearing it over 18th century-ish shirts and nightgowns anyways. I might make some early to mid 19th century shirts at some point, but that's mostly because I have some ideas for weird shawl collar waistcoats I want to make. If you want to make a patchwork garment, I think you should go for it. There's lots of different styles to choose from, 
As usual, I've made a Pinterest board, which I will link in the description. But if you do want to make your own version of this specific dressing gown, I think you should. I don't want anyone to feel like they can't make some historical garment just because somebody else already did. That's silly. And you wouldn't even be copying me if we're both copying something someone else made almost 200 years ago. Especially since no two people who recreate a costume are going to do it the exact same. And that's even more true of patchwork. Because we've all got different cabbage. Just don't give yourself a deadline, and think about the corners before starting, especially if you have thick fabric. The more corners you have intersecting at one point, the bumpier it will be. My eight corner intersections were very troublesome, but if you do diamonds or squares, you'll only have four corners meeting, and my four corner intersections were much smoother and easier to work with. Hexagons would be the absolute thinnest because they've only ever got three corners meeting, and there are a couple of nice 1860s dressing gowns with hexagons. You could also arrange the triangles in a different way to cut down on the bulk a bit. And there are 20th century examples with lots of irregular shapes that don't have a lot of corners lining up anywhere. They're sort of similar to Victorian crazy quilts, and they're quite nice. However, my friend told me that the corners are a bit less bulky if you sew it by hand using English paper piecing. Uh, so I made this little sample. And yeah, it is a bit less bulky, but still thick enough that sewing it up would be troublesome, because eight corners is a lot, no matter how you put it together. Oh, that was a much longer outro than I expected to write, but I think I've said all the things I have to say about this project. I had not! I forgot to say thank you to everyone who gave me bits of fabric that ended up in this, and to Glynis from the Powerhouse Museum for sending those photos of the inside, and helping me get permission to use the other photos in this video. Thank you very, very much. Okay, I'm gonna go start editing a very large amount of video clips. Just a horrible, just absolutely gigantic mountain of sewing footage. Okay, bye.